technology that has the potential to really fundamentally change our societies for the good. You're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, back uh, back at Think 2018 in Vegas, I met Peter Corson, an IBM exec, and he gave me this little um, uh, this little coin. And it's a Bitcoin coin. It has a Bitcoin logo on it, and says "Digital Decentralized and Peer to Peer." That sounds like a bunch of buzzwords to me. So, what does that mean for business? Uh, hey, Tommy. This is Andy. You know, I'm up for answering that question for you, but let's do it in about 30 minutes. You know, on the show proper. Okay? That sounds good. As a matter of fact, you want to say hi to the audience. Hi, it's Andy. Andy Modin here, Mr. Blockchain. <laughs> Tim Duncan, product growth from Biomarket. <laughs> Wonderful. So make sure you join us in 30 minutes for the 11th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanme. Blockchain technology is a concept that causes great confusion in the market, but it's a technology that has potential to really fundamentally change our societies for the good. You're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, back uh, back at Think 2018 in Vegas, I met Peter Corson, an IBM exec, and he gave me this little um, uh, this little coin. And it's a Bitcoin coin. It has a Bitcoin logo on it, and says "Digital Decentralized and Peer to Peer." That sounds like a bunch of buzzwords to me. So, what does that mean for business? Uh, hey, Tommy, this is Andy. You know, I'm up for answering that question for you, but let's do it in about the about Hello and welcome everybody to the 11th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. I hope you're all doing well, hope you're all keeping safe. Thank you for joining today's live stream. Now, last week on the series, we talked about the world of cybersecurity. And of course, one of the key points that we talked about was trust. Now, in the real world, trust is really hard to come by. There's always going to be you know, a combination of accidents and incidents that we need to prepare for and plan to deal with. And one of the cornerstone technologies when it comes to dealing with the world of trust is that of blockchain. And uh, personally, I would say it's a technology that I feel is very polarizing in a way. And, and the reason I say that is because, of course, there's the classical joke of, do you need a blockchain? No, you don't. Just use a database. Uh, but then there's also the very valid application of blockchain concepts to different fields, uh, like cryptocurrency, different use cases like IBM's Food Trust, and, and so many more like them. And therefore, I really want to get to the bottom of this. I want to understand what is blockchain, right? Where does its value lie for businesses? And is it really just a fancy database or, or does it enable something else that's special in the real world? And today we're going to be hearing from some really bright folks. So we have got Andy Martin, who is the worldwide uh, blockchain value design lead at IBM and Tim Duncan, a product growth lead at Bottle Rocket. Now, Andy has built out IBM's blockchain value design capability from day one. He has over 25 years of experience at IBM. And, you know, while we haven't met in person, uh, me, me and Andy, I will say that it doesn't feel like I don't know him because, you know, the feedback that he shares and the thoughts that he has and the concern that he has for the work that I do is something that I really appreciate and that I really enjoy. And for Tim, uh, Timothy Duncan, he's, he's sort of hard to introduce in, in the sense that Tim has been, you know, a mentor for me. Tim has been a guide, and he's just kind of the person that 
You know, when you interact with him, when you work with him, you get inspired to do so much more. And Tim has a diverse, uh, really has experience with a diverse group of technologies. And he's responsible for, for leveraging them and planning out how to use them to future-proof and enable the success of different offerings. And so now, without any further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Andy and Tim. Welcome to the show, Andy and Tim. I'm very glad to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. That's really exciting. I can't wait to see what we have in store today. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, technology is something that I feel like we don't usually associate creativity with. Um, and uh, and, and you know, the world of technology, I believe, actually is a very creative world. Uh, as a matter of fact, behind you, I see a painting by your 15 year old daughter, Katie. Would you like to share that with the audience? Tell us a little bit about that.
All right, we're back, everybody. And in theory, you should be able to hear me now, and you should be able to hear our two special guests. So really quickly, uh, Andy, quick intro. Let's try that one more time. We got to <clears throat> change audio devices, of course. Oh. You also want to ask, you know, how would the man in the street think about blockchain? Um, and I think if you if you ask that, that that first question, how would they think about blockchain? Um, you should go back to 1995, and the first um, implementation of the internet was the World Wide Web. So this is like an internet of information, uh, an information superhighway. Dial forward to 2008, 2009, as we move into the world of blockchain. We now have a re-implementation of the internet, and now we have a transaction superhighway. You know, so as my old boss Jimmy Rometty would say, you know, what you know, blockchain will do for transactions, what the World Wide Web did for information. But there's two or three nuances that are super important. Two or three things that are different that are super important. You know, the first is that asset um, that you're trading could be anything. It doesn't have to be digitally, digitally native, like a Bitcoin. Uh, it could represent, it could be a link to a physical asset, like something you put on the supply chain. Um, secondly, with a blockchain, you can own that digital asset. So you can trade that peer-to-peer -peer without the need for anybody to make sure the ownership has been transferred and to make sure there's no double spend. So if I look at that pattern and then think about that 40%, well, the first chunk of that pattern is gonna be in payments, right? But because that asset could be anything, there's a whole ton of other use cases where you could use a blockchain. So first of all, around identity. You know, if you think about the way applications have been built for the internet so far, you have to establish identity every time. That's a pain in the neck. Uh, whereas with, blockchain technology, we could have self-sovereign ID. So you have your identity captured um, on the blockchain. And that could be identity of people, identity of things like autonomous cars, identity of companies. Secondly, let's move into supply chain. There's a ton of use cases in supply chain because that asset could be the physical goods that are moving up and down the supply chain. And blockchain gives you the provenance and the visibility to efficiently manage that supply chain. So if you put those three things together, you start to create digital marketplaces where you know who you're dealing with, uh, you know the asset that you're trading, uh, and you know uh, you can make a payment natively where you can clear and settle at the same time. So this brings us into the whole sphere of marketplaces where you can tokenize this asset so you can drive a whole lot of innovative new ways of trading. So the world is your oyster. Anything that can be traded can be a blockchain use case. So I'll hand back to you, uh, Tammy. Yeah, sure, absolutely, Tammy. So, you know, when I think about that question, like in, in the context of the consumer facing aspect, and that's kind of the lens I'm trying to bring here, which is, you know, I think Andy has a, a, a really good view of what's going on in the business aspect of the networks that are being built, but you know, I don't have that same lens. And so my lens is really what's happening on the consumer facing side. What applications can I play with? What new services are there that are available to me that are expressed as, as a result of using blockchain technology? And so if I try and break down the whole like 60, 40% of value in terms of the finance sector in the, on the consumer side of things, you know, I feel like you could equate the 60% of value into like cryptocurrencies, right? Like whenever people think about blockchain technology on that side, they think of cryptocurrencies. And the market value right now of all the cryptocurrencies in circulation that's being tracked is 272 billion. So 
but that's not the full story on the consumer side of things, right? So there is another 40% of stuff going on. And that is where I think is the real value and where the real innovation is taking place, which is like, you know, there's these two other areas, which I think are emerging, which are first decentralized applications is one. So more commonly referred to as dApps. And so like, think of like, you know, Crypto Kitties, for example, is, is one of those, or Decentraland, for example. There's like these applications that are possible as a result of using blockchain technologies. And then also like non-fungible digital assets that are based upon unique identifiers. Like that also is a whole different new way of thinking about things in, the, in this digital world. So like think about unique baseball cards that can never be never be replicated. Or if you have like, something like Pokemon, di digital Pokemon cards, and you're able to like read those two together, get another unique asset. Like, but you can have the trust that those things are really are one of one and they're saved on a record that's immutable. So I think there, I think there is a similar story on the consumer facing side of, of blockchain in the cryptocurrency realm. There are other things that are being built on top of that. And I think that's really where the growth and the value will take place in, on that, on the consumer facing side as business the business side of the network comes together and i think we'll talk more about that as we go along thank you very much for sharing andy and tim and you know that's actually why i believe today's discussion is going to be so valuable is because we've got two you know very diverse viewpoints we got one from you know the business side of things and the value that it provides there but at the same time we've got inside the sort of consumer end and so i feel like today is going to be a really exciting discussion and so now actually speaking about this whole business versus consumers and application for blockchain i wanted to ask and i feel like andy this would be a this would be a great question for you to answer what really is, is is the difference between blockchain for business and how it can be applied there versus consumer applications, things like Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or things that you know consumers think of when they think of blockchain? And the reason I'm asking that is because you know how how exactly can can businesses actually use blockchain with all the necessary you know the compliance issues and the, the privacy requirements? What are your thoughts around that? So I think we have two worlds here. So the first world is the, the Bitcoin world, for example, the, um, the, 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 the crypto world. Um, and here, the problem that um, Bitcoin is trying to solve is censorship resistance. Okay, so how can you create a network that is resistant to any external party trying to knock it down? Um, and there's a trade-off when you take that pattern and you move it into business. Um, and, and the trade-off is, you know, you now want to have the ability to have privacy, you want to have the ability to have compliance, you want to have the ability to have finality. So it's almost like a mirror, okay? So if you think about the, the Bitcoin world, this is a world uh, which is permissionless. We don't know who sits behind the key. You can do a little bit of work and reverse engineer who that, who that is maybe, but up front, you don't know who that person is. It's permissionless, but it's public. Everybody has a copy of the whole ledger, the history of transactions through time. As you move into a business blockchain, you flip that. So first of all, that has to be permissioned. You know, we have to go through know your customer KYC checks, uh, anti-money laundering checks, AML checks. We have to know who is the person. And if you're doing trades on a marketplace, you only want your counterparties to have visibility of that data. So it's a flip. So you only want to be sharing the ledger or have visibility of the ledger for the transactions which you need to see. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a flip. And you know, if, you, if you look at something like um, Hyperledger Fabric or Corda, um, you know, so, so, so Richard Brown is the CTO of Corda, he's, he's ex-IBM. And back about late 2017, maybe early 2018, you know, he, he went to the market and said, you know, Cord is not a blockchain. It's inspired by blockchain, but it's not a blockchain. And actually the market wasn't very happy about that because Bitcoin was kind of zooming through the roof at the time. So from a marketing perspective, we, two, we call these two worlds blockchains, right? But a purist, a Bitcoin purist would look at what we're doing in the business space and say that's not censorship resistant. Therefore, it's not a blockchain. So we have these two worlds. And right now these two worlds are separate, but they're coming together. Uh, and we'll talk about that later, but right now they're quite separate. 
and inspired by blockchain maybe is the language to use because it's not censorship resistant because we've, we've gone for um, privacy and, and compliance. Thank you for sharing. And in fact, actually, your your answer there has answered one of the questions that I've personally had for for so long, which is, you know, if you take a look at the core technology that goes behind something like, you know, pure blockchain behind like Bitcoin, right, versus what would be implemented in a, in a real world business use case, like the IBM Food Trust, for example, right, that that's that's fundamentally very different concept. And from a lot of people's point of view, when you look at it from a technical perspective, maybe you wouldn't call it a real blockchain per se. But I really like what you mentioned in terms of, for marketing, it kind of becomes necessary to, to call it a blockchain, right? Because it's inspired by blockchain concepts, and saying inspired by blockchain isn't nearly as saleable as it's a blockchain, right? So um, so for marketing, that is pretty important. And and at the same time, it's, a, it's an exciting technology, right? It does enable us to do things that previously um, were, were at least very difficult to, to do, right? If not impossible in some use cases. And today I, I count it uh, under one of the sort of major innovations under that umbrella of technologies like AI and IoT and, and quantum computing and other sorts of technologies. But at the same time, when you take a look at what technologies people value the most, right? You, you take a look at technologies like, say, machine learning and cloud computing and blockchain. 72% of, of companies uh, a couple of years ago voted machine learning as the most innovative technology, whereas that was only 7% for blockchain. So 72% for machine learning, 7% for blockchain. And I'm over here wondering, why exactly was that value so low for blockchain? Why wasn't it a more uniform distribution between the two technologies? Now, the reason those don't add up to 100 is because there's also cloud computing in the mix at like 13%, but still, I'm confused as to why exactly was that value so low for blockchain? Does that mean the scope for implementation is a bit more narrow? And at the same time, what what sort of value does it enable? And, and how can we get that number to be higher? Do we think it will be in the future? Uh, okay, well, I mean, I can I can take that one again, Tanmay. So I'm going to go back to my first answer, actually. Um, you know, and I said, it's not a bad thing to stop thinking about the World Wide Web. You know, and I'm so old, I can remember spending £2,000 at the back end of 1999 to buy a load of dot-coms, right? Uh, and then the 1st of January uh, 2000, they were worth 90% less than they had been um, the, day, the week before. You know, I lost almost all my investment, right? And, of course, what had happened was the market had got all excited about the World Wide Web, created this crazy hype, and then the thing crashed. And while everybody was looking the opposite direction, then the internet happened. And the same thing's happening here, right? You have that hype cycle of the way up, everybody getting all excited. Uh, you then have the crash, everybody turns around and looks at something else. And while they're not looking, the Googles of the world are being created. And if you're observant, you'll actually notice that every single week, there's a new production live network. You know, so one that I was working on, Mindhub, for example, which is in the commodities uh, market, they did their first live production, I think, two weeks ago, their, their first live uh, transaction, a 14 million or a 15 million transaction. So this stuff is happening while people are looking the other way because you've gone through the classic hype cycle, the uh, crash, and now we're entering the, 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 the plateau of productivity while nobody's watching, right? Um, now, you talked about the scope of use cases and, you know, in the answer to my the first question, I said, look, that asset could be anything, right? Anything that you can trade can be a use case. So the use cases that, that we're actually seeing out there on the business side are huge. You know, I, I, we could spend the whole call talking about those use cases. But I'm going to walk through just four examples to show you where this stuff is becoming real, right? And where the value is being added right now today. So um, the asset, the trade, could be in any industry, right? But there's some foundation use cases that are helpful for every industry. So let's start with identity. Now, blockchain is writing a wrong. <laughs> and the wrong is that when the World Wide Web was installed, nobody thought about identity. It wasn't native to the protocol. So every time you build an application, you've got to recreate it. And what does that mean? The temptation is you're going to sign on with your Facebook credentials, but you're going to sign on with your Google credentials. Right? What you don't realize is you're giving phenomenally valuable information to Google and to Facebook. 
which they can monetize. You're turning yourself into a digital surf. So the first use case is about taking control back of our identity, either as individuals or as companies. So for example, IBM has a, a use case called Trust Your Supplier, which is about creating identity of suppliers and getting those onto the internet, which means that if you're a buyer and you want to onboard that supplier, you don't have to go through all of those KYC, AML, compliance, certification, all of that stuff, which takes forever. You just plug in the credentials of their, um, you know, trust over IP, off you go. So that saves a shed load of cost. So that's identity, right? And that identity, those companies, you know, could operate in multiple industries. So that's like a cross industry. Um, if we then look at an example in, say, finance, uh, I'm going to talk about WeTrade. Now, one of the things that blockchain is great about is the little guy, right? Now, if you're a small company, right, and you're looking to do your first export, you probably don't know who is buying the stuff at the other end. It's the other end of the world. It's months enough to get there. This is a high risk transaction for you. You need a bank to come in and help you out and make sure you get the money and make sure you get the money fairly soon rather than very late. The problem is providing trade finance to big companies is way too expensive, uh, to small companies is too expensive because the account opening cost is too high. But just like that trust your supplier, if you can get all of those onboarding credentials done up front, that identity established up front, you can open an account really quickly and you can offer finance um, at much lower cost. So 50% of small companies don't get access to trade finance today. You can fix that with blockchain. And we are fixing that with blockchain. I mean, we trade, they were on a consensus. They're looking to get up to 30,000 transactions, I think, next year. Um, so this is really now starting to ramp up. Well, actually, this year, so this is really starting to ramp up and become real. Um, I want to talk about an example in supply chain. Um, this is Venturas. Um, you know, if you buy something from Amazon, but you track that door to door. You know, you go onto the app, you can see exactly where it is. Right? You try doing that for a new car. Well, you were only 16, right? <laughs> but um, I can tell you now, if you did buy a new car, you get no visibility back. It's months until kind of the day before the, de the, the dealer rings you up and says, oh, the car's here. If there's any problems with that car, like it's had a dent uh, and you need an insurance claim or you want to change the spec at the last minute, you know, good luck, right? Whereas a bunch of, of small, medium-sized logistics players in the automotive uh, distribution industry have got together and collectively and collaboratively, they have enough clout to make a real impact on the market and to offer that visibility and to offer these new value props to customers. So, you know, this stuff is real and it's happening, you know, right now. And then my final uh, example before I, uh, I hand back to you is we're starting to see marketplaces open up uh, where commodities are being tokenized. So we're now getting very innovative marketplaces where you've got tokens for the settlement coin. So you've got a stable coin for dollars or euro. You've got a token for the asset which you're buying and selling. Uh, we've got a token to drive um, endorsers of transaction and orderers. So you've got the decentralized marketplace. And we've got a token to fractionalize um, assets so you can, you can trade in components. So the world where you have those tokens in your wallet as the entry point into a marketplace is becoming real. So my answer to your question is, why only 7%? Well, it's because everybody's looking in the wrong direction. And what are the use cases? Anything you can trade. Anything you can trade. Anything to anything. It's the world of commerce. So back to you. Thank you for sharing, uh, Andy. And also, Tim, would you like to share your thoughts? Um, you know, I think that was a really good expansive overview on that one. Do you want to go on to another question and talk about a different concept? Definitely. As a matter of fact, I actually do want to talk about something that we're, uh, we're, we're sort of getting questions around this in the live stream. We'll get to those in a moment. But first, a, a sort of more fundamental question that I want to ask is, with every technology out there, there's, there's parts of it that people fundamentally don't understand, or at least the average person doesn't understand. And I believe that AI, which is the technology that I work with most, 
there's a lot of things within AI that people really don't understand. Um, in fact, I believe AI is the most misunderstood technology in the world. You know, people will take simple mathematical models and equate those to intelligence because of the way that those mathematical models behave, for, for lack of a better word. Um, so, are there parts of blockchain that you believe the average person doesn't get in the sense that it's talked about in a different way versus what it actually does from a technical perspective? I'll take this one. Um, so I, I wrote down two two areas here from like from a, from a consumer facing standpoint that I that I think fits that narrative. Uh, one is I think Andy alluded to it in one of his answers is if you use Bitcoin for some kind of transaction, regardless of if it's illegal or not, you can't be traced, which that is not true. You know, Bitcoin has been around for so long, and there have been you know reports out there where they were able to kind of cross track and triangulate different identities based upon you know just the history in general so like that's that's not a that's not completely true now there are other networks out there where they have taken even further steps to you know wash those transactions and like some kind of like tumbling method but the 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 fallacy i think still holds for bitcoin which is like you know, it's, it's not a place where you can just get away with anything. And then secondly, the other side of the of, of the coin on that is like, you know, you, you might hear a lot of like, there's no use cases for Bitcoin or there's no use cases for fully permissionless networks, which I also think is not true. You know, I think in particular in countries where there are financial situations with governments that are very corrupt, I think there are value there is value into having a fully permissionless network where people are able to be unbanked or have access to something that they can trust. So, you know, I think that there it's harder, it's hard for, for people to see and understand the raw technology that is blockchain or Bitcoin and how it, the impact that it can have. And I think it's important to keep in mind just how little of time it has been since, since blockchain and Bitcoin have been around. I mean, it has been just over a decade. That is a really small amount of time for a raw transformative piece of technology to have the fundamental impacts that, that we all know it can have. So like, I think, I think it's important to keep that frame of reference in mind because even though we're in a society where things are moving so fast, this is a brand new technology that nobody really had any idea how to use or had seen before just over a decade ago. So anyway. I, I'd also like to try and answer that question, but um, I'd like to answer it from the question from, from the perspective of a business person. Okay, so what is the a common misperception of blockchain by a business person? Um, and I'm actually going to read out a quote uh, verbatim, word for word, by a lady called Sherman uh, Vosmagir, uh, and she wrote a book called The Token Economy. Okay, I'm going to read this word for word, and it's a really super quote. And it really explains, I think, where a lot of business people are not understanding blockchain or business uh, versions of blockchain, right? So she, so, so, so she says, you know, blockchain is the driving force of the next generation internet, often referred to as Web 3.0. It is not a front end revolution. It's a change around data structures at the back end of the internet. Blockchain allows us to have a universal state layer of who did what and who owned what in terms of values or tokens. This is a completely new way of storing and collectively validating data via ledgers, which are collectively managed by a public or a federated network. Now here's the, here's the punchline. Blockchain is not a financial technology. It is a governance technology. The governance technology. Let me unpack that for you. Blockchain is really about governance of data. It's about um, ownership of that data and the power to use that data in a marketplace. There really is a decision that needs to be made. Blockchain, from a business point of view, is not something that um, is necessarily given. It's something that needs to be taken, um, taken to change the dynamics of a market to change the power dynamics of the market, you know, particularly around things like identity. So, you know, I would say, think about blockchain primarily as a governance technology um, for that back end state of those objects that have been traded peer to peer. 
safety. That is a very insightful quote. Thank you very much. You're right. That that pu that punchline. Blockchain is not a finance technology. It is a governance technology that really shifts the way that people think about blockchain. Of course, from a business perspective, but I also believe that that also has sort of wider-reaching implication to consumers as well, based off of the way that businesses go ahead and apply that. As a matter of fact, to sort of expand upon what we've been talking about here, I want to move into the world of not even just necessarily blockchain, but just generally fully decentralized networks, right? They definitely have a place for, for sure. And, and, and cryptocurrency is like the prime example of something that consumers see and feel and interact with, um, you know, potentially on a day-to-day -day basis if, if, if you work with cryptocurrency. Um, and what I want to sort of ask you is fully decentralized public uh, networks, uh, like for example, that of Bitcoin. Again, they're, they, they are a sort of they're a way to solve a very, they're a, they're a solution to a very niche set of problems. And my question for you is, when it comes to these fully decentralized public networks, what are some other use cases apart from this world of cryptocurrency that consumers or even businesses can expect to use them for? What are some real world use cases where you would want to use a fully decentralized public network and it actually has more advantages than disadvantages compared to say, in a regular old database. What are some use cases around that? Well, I'll take that one first. Um, you know, <clears throat> so to start with, I think another another really interesting use case for from a consumer facing standpoint for a fully permissionless network that I didn't touch on is, you know, I think one of the key ones is being able to send money over large distances without knowing someone. You know, I've heard someone describe uh, Bitcoin as, or I mean, Bitcoin in general, as an algorithm that allows two people who have never known each other, Bitcoin is so precise that it allows two people who have never known each other, the ability to exchange value, regardless of distance. Um, you know, I think that's a really good way of like, that, like of portraying what it is, but it, fundamentally it's a governance technology, as Andy said, it, it gives you the ability to govern that transaction, not actually create the currency. So you know, I, I think another really good area to, I think, can have a much bigger impact on, like, society is in government. And that's where I, I, I really think there's a lot of areas and use cases from a governance standpoint that you can have. And one of the best use cases that I've seen personally was out of um, South Korea and Seoul. And Seoul. So they have a, a network called S-Coin. If you, if you go, you can, it's, actually, it's actually live. You can go check it out. But essentially... It gives residents the ability to collect these coins in exchange for public services. So whenever you file for taxes, for example, you might get some of this S coin. And then residents are able to use that coin to transact. And, and it's not taxable whenever you transact it with merchants or you're able to do different services for, for the government that they that they put on, you're taking you can take advantage of. So I think there are there are lots of applications in different industries if you just understand what Andy just said, and I wrote that down in, in my books. I think that's a great, a great quote. It's a governance technology, not a, not a finance technology. Uh, yeah, so tell me, I'd, I'd also like to try and answer that question, but I, I'd like to answer it slightly differently. And I was, I was listening carefully to the words that you used uh, as you asked it, that question, and kind of hiding in the words was um, this notion of, well, what's the difference between a central database and a decentralized solution, okay? And that's equally important in the world of business. Uh, and I'm going to give you a quote from a chap called Brian Bellendorf. Now, Brian, if you don't know him, um, he is the executive that runs um, the Hyperledger Fabric project, uh, open source project, as part of the Linux Foundation. So it's his responsibility to help bring business blockchains to market. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase him rather than creating word for word. But what he effectively said, and this is super, super important, um, is he said, well, technically, if you stand back, you could probably implement most, if not all, blockchain use cases on a central database. It's going to be cheaper and it's going to be quicker than doing it on a blockchain. So the question then is, well, why would I want to do it on a blockchain? And the answer is because it's better on the blockchain, right? Now, why is it better? It's better because there are some use cases where the data which needs to be shared is so valuable 
that the market participants do not want to give up control of that data to a central player. And where this has happened in the past, what's happened is that central player has ended up controlling the market and become the most valuable player in the market. You know, this happened in the, in the airline industry where the, uh, the player that actually organized the tickets and uh, arranged the buying and selling of tickets became more valuable than the airlines. And you kind of think, duh, but not great, right? You don't really want to commoditize your business. And the flip side of that is there are other markets which have never had this centralization because folks wouldn't give up control of their data. So you just have a ton of inefficiency. So what you really need to say to yourself is, if data is valuable, I don't want to give it up to a third party, but I need that common view of the truth where everybody can go to see what's going on. That's what a blockchain gives you because the governance stays with the owner of the data. So you can govern your data in one place where everybody can see what's going on. And the first benefit of that is what's called ecosystem reconciliation. Because every time a trade happens, you know, I have my transaction, you have your transaction, we have to reconcile everything line for line. There are armies of people, armies of systems trying to do this reconciliation. If you move that data up into one place on a blockchain, there's no reconciliation. So the cost of processing transactions plummet. This is not a technology cost. This is a people cost in trying to reconcile the data. Um, as you become more decentralized, you can start to see benefits of collaboration. So, for example, that, that insurance example, where three or four of the small, smaller players could get together and have bigger market clout. You know, you're starting to change the dynamics of the market and small players can have the same impact as a big player. So you can reach more customers through network effects and you can launch more digital products and services. So that's really exciting. And then the final piece, which is where it gets super exciting, is where you go digitally native. Okay, And then this is where you are now building these token marketplaces, where you are capturing your asset that you're trading as a token, which can be subdivided in, into smaller parts so you can drive lots of secondary markets, where you can um, clear and settle at the same time. So you've got a coin for settlement, like a, a USD stable coin, and you've got a, a coin for ownership, which is maybe the commodity, you can do that clear and settle at the same time. Usually it takes like three days. You do it at the same time with no reconciliation and you can break it down into tiny parts. That is massively transformative to the way markets operate. Um, and then the final thing is, which is maybe the most exciting of all, is you can capture an entire economy in code. Now, that sounds a little ambitious, but if you scale it back and we're just looking at business to business transactions as opposed to a whole like the economy of the US or something, that is containable. You can model at the level of a business to business transaction. And the governing entity can now look to design incentives to change behavior to drive increased volumes of transactions where maybe, maybe you're looking to design incentives to equalize value across the members. So they all have an equal incentive to want to collaborate. So this is phenomenally transformative for, 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 for business. So we're able to transform at the level of an ecosystem, at the level of a market, or even at the level of an industry, if we choose to make it so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. This is this is really exciting stuff. And you know, the, the, these answers have, have, oh, sorry, Tim, did you want to share another thought? I was just going to say, I, mean, I do think that's really interesting. The only thing I want to highlight on, on this side as a follow up to that is like, you know, I think it's exciting to see how much development is going on in the business side of blockchain development. And I think Andy has an awesome view in, into what's going on. I think there's a, there's a lot more than what people see. And, you know, I think going back to the whole, that's not a permissionless blockchain. So that's, that's not permissionless. So it's not, it's not blockchain, right. To like a, 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 a native true Bitcoiner, so to speak, or, um, but I think, I think what's, what's, what's interesting to highlight is that I think the fundamental difference between consumer facing blockchain and decentralized networks and business blockchain networks is the rate at which they are moving and developing in terms of the nature of their decentralization. It's ridiculous to, to expect a business to instantaneously become decentralized overnight. You know, like the, like the amount, the, the pure amount of infrastructure that has been built 
on these businesses over time is very complex and it can't just go away. Now, Bitcoin had the, the advantage of not having to deal with any of that existing infrastructure that a business has. So yes, it is fully decentralized, but that, that's because you know, they, they started from ground zero. So I think the, the progression of business as they, as they automate, automate and codify more of their business on a blockchain network and become more and more decentralized as, as much as they can, I think that is when they come together and you can see them start to bridge and find gaps to where you can use them alongside of these fully decentralized networks. I think that's just an interesting, it's an interesting concept to think about and to watch that intersection take place. Yeah, exactly. You're absolutely right. And, and, and some of these answers have, have really changed the way that I think about blockchain in, in a way, and, and, and especially in the terms of, you know, what Andy and, and you were mentioning and, in the differences between blockchain for business and blockchain for consumers and the different advantages and disadvantages and use cases for both. As a matter of fact, before we continue, there is a question that we're getting from the live stream. This is a question from Tassin. Uh, he is asking, what are the disadvantages of blockchain? So we've talked about the advantages and, and we've talked about, you know, what's great about them. Before we continue, I do want to quickly answer that question from both the business and the consumer perspective. What are the disadvantages of using blockchain technology? And do we expect that we can, you know, in the future, work towards solving those disadvantages and, and work towards a better technology? Yeah. You want me to okay. take the one uh, first, Andy? Or do oh, you want to go yeah. first? Oh, uh, I'm happy. You, you, you go. All right. I'll, I'll touch on one from the consumer-facing standpoint real quick. You know, I, I think the... I think the classic one is the whole like you lose your key or your or your public key yeah. password to whatever the value is on whatever chain you're talking about and it's just gone for forever right so like yes w when you're in a fully decentralized network yes you have total control but that also means you have to total control over the management of whatever it is that's controlling that so if you lose your key it's gone forever unless you're able to hire somebody who can recreate that key which I think it's few and far between, but you have to be fully aware of just how much, you know, how big a responsibility it is in a permissionless network to, you know, manage the key and what, what you're doing. So I think one of the disadvantages is not having the failure mechanisms in the backup to help people that might do something by accident, right? And so I think you're seeing things that are being built like, you know, backup recovery systems and, and wallets that are secure that can live on your phone so that people don't have to worry about so much about handling those private keys. Uh, so I'd also like to answer that. And, and I'll start actually by, by picking up the point about the keys, because what's interesting is in the business world, that asset may well have a link to something physical. So the value is not digitally native. So with a Bitcoin, your key is the money, right? Whereas if you're trading a bag of cobalt, right? Um, there's a physical bag of cobalt uh, and then your key is then linked to that bag of cobalt. So if you lose your key, it's not inconceivable that the issuer could burn that token and reissue and relink. Now you may have to pay a fee because you're not gonna do it for free, right? But you, you can't lose that bag of cobalt, <laughs> right? So, um, there are advantages there. And um, also I'm starting to see the beginnings of custodian services where when you're going into these marketplaces, you would, you would never see your private key. You would never see it, right? That the custodian is managing that on your behalf. So that risk has been taken away. Obviously you, you're going to have to pay like a cost for it, but if you're going to be trading on the markets and you're going to be trading in, 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 you know, large sums of money, you know, businesses are not going to, Countenance the fact you could lose your key, right? So those problems are kind of being fixed in the corporate world uh, by custodian services and by this, this nature of a, of a reissue and a burn. Um, if, if you look at the disadvantage of, 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 a, of a blockchain over a traditional approach, well, you know, I think you have to go back to Brian Bellendorf, right? And, you know, what Brian said was, you could build every use case on a central database if you want to. So technically, it's always going to be quicker, cheaper, and lower cost, right? But you build it on a blockchain because the data is so valuable, you don't want to give it away. You don't want to end up like the airline industry where the ticketing business becomes worth more than the airlines, right? So 
you choose to go down the blockchain route, but it's not painless. It's hard enough to get one company on its own to change the way it does business. It's even harder to get three or four companies setting up the beginnings of a private network to change the way that they do business. It's harder still to get 20 or 30 companies within a market uh, to change the way they do, do their business. It's harder still to get a thousand companies. So it's hard. Uh, and most Blockchains for business haven't really got beyond the sort of the, the, the tens of members. They're not yet into the thousands. I mean, there's maybe, maybe trade lens is kind of there. But, um, so there's a huge amount of effort in governance. And the governance actually in a business blockchain is largely off chain. So you have to get a bunch of folks in a room and you have to agree what's the marketplace rules. How do we get folks onto the network? How do we get folks off the network? How do we handle disputes? How do we handle things that we haven't thought about when they go wrong? So there's a ton of work in governance, um, and that's painful, but it's a good investment. So the lead time on, on a private blockchain um, or a blockchain compared to a non-blockchain solution is always going to be harder because of that. But you're building for the future. You're building for that transformation. And maybe you couldn't build this in a central database, not technically, but business-wise because the businesses aren't that stupid to business data. They're not going to go for a Facebook model very much and, become, and, and be made the product. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for sharing. And, you know, it, it's interesting to see what exactly those disadvantages are of, of blockchain technology that we don't usually see, right? What, like, for example, what you said, Tim, in terms of just being, you know, losing your key and suddenly you completely lost access to, uh, to your identity on that blockchain. I believe there was the famous incident of, uh, of a guy who had a few hundred Bitcoin locked up in, uh, in his wallet and he lost his, uh, he lost his keys. There was a few million dollars sitting there and, and there's nothing you can do because he lost his key. <laughs> there's no way you can really recover that, uh, which actually I do want to get to that world of cracking blockchain in just a minute. But first of all, Andy, what you mentioned in terms of the difficulty of, of, of sort of getting that governance model in place and getting the adoption, you know, that, that initial adoption set up, that's sometimes the hardest part. Um, I want to expand upon that a little bit. And, you know, we, we've seen through the past couple of, um, you know, minutes that decentralization can absolutely transform whole ecosystems. And the question is, how exactly can, can a market or how can an industry or how can a specific business start on that journey of going towards this sort of decentralized nature? How difficult is it and how should they go about doing it? Right, so I've seen various entry points, um, but I'll give you one example, which is a real example, uh, because this is not a bad template, okay? And this is the famous trade lens, okay? Well, so. This started out as a private MERSC only network. Okay, so it's relatively straightforward to get your own trading partners onto a private network. Um, you can do that reasonably quickly, particularly if the convening company has some power in that market and they have gravitational pull to bring in their own supply chain. So you have like a private network, which is really just looking at MERSC's trading partners. Now, you could stop at that point. But what happened with trade lens was we very quickly realized that we weren't solving the problem because the problem was that when a ship comes into, into a port like the Port of Rotterdam, um, the Port of Rotterdam doesn't want to have to deal with 20 blockchains, you know, one for each major shipping firm. They want one blockchain, right? It doesn't really make sense to solve that problem of visibility of, of that asset going up and down supply chains on a company by company basis. It makes sense to do it on a market basis. So what we did was we had, we had to go back, open up the governance and say, OK, what do we have to do to make it fair for Merck's competitors to join this network? You have a network of competitors and that's about governance. Now, it took us a long time to unpick the mistakes, rebuild the governance model and then relaunch as a utility. Now, having learned from those mistakes, you could start out with your own private network, but with the rules, the governance structure that let you onboard uh, your competitors to quickly span out to become a, a more of a utility. Um, and then if you look at trade lens, it's morphing now into this marketplace. 
where you now have this asset of wonderful data, which didn't exist before, and a whole load of innovators can come in and start innovating on top of that data. And you now have a marketplace of buyers and sellers of data, and you're building actually a digital industry. So you have the traditional industry, but then you have a new digital industry, which is being born that sits on top of it, which is harvesting that data. So there's, there's kind of like that three layer route as you go from a very private, closed, quite centralized network, open up the valve to become more decentralized as you become a marketplace utility, then open the valve up even further as innovators come in and innovate new value props on top and drive new market models. Um, now, you don't have to go in that sequence. You could start with the new market model or you could start with the utility, um, but it's probably easier to kind of go and build up slowly. So we so have a fair amount of experience now of making that transition from small to big to bigger. Uh, and it's actually all about the governance, really. Because it's about power, who controls that information. And Absolutely. That has to be fair. Absolutely. And, and I, I, again, sort of, if we go back to the quote that you were sharing, you know, blockchain is a governance technology. That's, uh, it comes right back to that. And that transition, while it is difficult, I do believe it is something that will benefit businesses and industries as a whole and consumers, everybody uh, in the near future. I mean, Timothy, what you mentioned with, you know, blockchain, the core concept, at least for, for modern blockchain, have only been around for like, what, 10 years now? Um, less than that maybe a little more, uh, so approximately that sort of, um, that time span. And if you take a look at the core concepts for a technology like like artificial intelligence, they've been around for decades. It, it, and and the, the even you know, further core around calculus, does, that's been around for centuries. And so we've had a lot of time to sort of, you know, work with that technology, work with that math, sort of get it down to where it is today, whereas with blockchain, it's, it's really brand new. And so I can see that this technology is definitely going to be growing a lot in the future. I mean, Andy, what you mentioned, that people are looking away right now, which is when we actually have the time to progress the technology. And this brings me to another technology that I think is, is currently experiencing that cycle of, you know, it's, it's, it's currently being hyped a lot, and eventually people are going to stop looking at it just like they're not looking at blockchain today, and that is quantum computing. Right, so we've gotten a couple of questions from the live stream, and there's a little bit of a interest that I have in this field. And I want to know, for the world of blockchain, a couple of things. First of all, do quantum computers and, and do quantum technologies pose a threat to blockchain technology, first of all? But also, in the future, when quantum computing is a thing, when quantum computing is powerful enough, when we have large quantum volume computers, will blockchain help us to be more secure from attacks from quantum computers. So from both ends, first of all, are today's blockchains, um, you know, going to be affected, going to be threatened by quantum technology, and in the future, can blockchain help us prevent against quantum attacks? I, I can I can take a stab at it first. You know, I, I don't I don't have a fun like a, a great fundamental understanding of the technical abilities of whether or not this would be possible. From from the research that I've done though. It, it has stated that, you know, the SHA-256 algorithm of Bitcoin is relatively resistant to current uh, quantum algorithms. And I think it's also important to, point out, important to point out just how small the current quantum computers on, in the public domain are right now in terms of how many qubits they have. Like, they're really small. So if we do get to a place where, you know, those computers get powerful enough, where that might change the narrative, you know, I... I wouldn't want to say nothing is, is it, I wouldn't want to say it's impossible to do it, but I think that, you know, in the short term, I think we're okay. And I think there's a lot of smart people out there that would continue to make sure that, you know, whatever the current networks are from a, from a fully decentralized standpoint, that they continue to stay protected. Uh, well, so I'm not, I'm not technical, but I, I will give you my perspective. So, um, I think it was three or four years ago, um, I was wandering through the halls at Hursley, which is the um, IBM lab in, in the UK. And I first saw a meeting, uh, which was about quantum. So I took a photograph, um, put it on social media and said, hands off my blockchain. Um, because clearly, if you can crack the encryption and if you have a digitally native asset, then that key is the money, right? Um, so this is something which concerns you now. I've seen kind of three things um, to try to mitigate that. Um, I think it was 
maybe think 2018, 2019, something like that, um, there was a pitch about what was called lattice encryption. So there are people in research that are developing um, the next form of encryption, which would be that much harder. So you're hoping to kind of stay ahead of the development of, of the quantum te the technology. Um, I've also heard about an idea um, where you actually do tokenization of the token. <laughs> um, so here, what we're talking about is, and I don't fully understand how this works, but I have heard about this, where you would substitute the payload for a synthetic data. So you've got some kind of vault, some sort of digital asset uh, custody solution where, where, where the actual data sits. You're putting um, synthetic data to, to, to actually be uh, transported over the internet. Um, and then there's some black magic um, to resolve that um, when, when, when you're looking to, to, to use that data. So I'm not entirely sure how that works, but um, I have seen that pattern. Uh, and then another pattern I've seen, which I think has been used by um, IBM's digital asset custody solution, I believe, um, I've yet to do some research on this, but I'm starting to get into, into it, which is where you start to break the message up into component parts. So if somebody cracks it, they've just cracked a bit of it, they haven't cracked all of it. So they've got to get all three, four, five bits of the message. So kind of what I'm seeing uh, from my non-technical perspective is a, recognized, a recognition that probably somebody's got a more powerful um, qubit machine than they're willing to talk about. Um, and if you want to be totally secure, you probably want to be ahead of the game and playing with these kind of uh, one, two, or three of these strategies will be. Uh, so I, I can't quite remember what, what, what I said towards the end, but um, I, 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 I've seen these three strategies uh, and I think probably my gut feel is you want to try and stay ahead of the curve here. And you probably want to assume that the world is worse than you think it is. Uh, you know, there's probably somebody in GCHQ or the NSA, which has got access to a big machine, right? <laughs> so if you want to be if you want to be censorship resistant from the secret services, you probably need to be thinking a little bit. You probably, probably want to up your game there. That absolutely makes sense. You know, it's it's always better to be safe than sorry is is what I would say, right? So start preparing right now. Uh, you know, assuming that quantum computers in the future will be a threat to blockchain, uh, and, and you know, you can never be too safe, especially when it comes to a technology like this one. Um, so yes, that that is definitely something that's important to prepare for for the for the future at least and so now i finally want to get uh to a couple more questions before we go to live questions from the audience we got quite a few questions coming in that uh, people are really excited to know more about blockchain but first i want to see what the future of blockchain looks like and just so that we can get a more clear picture of what that means from both a business and a consumer pers perspective I want to split this up into three different versions of what does the future look like. First of all, what does the future look like a year from now? Then what does it look like five years from now? And then what does it look like 10 years from now? Okay, so let's start off with what does the future of blockchain look like 10 years for, uh, or one year from now? I guess I can go, I, I guess I'll take the first stab at that in terms of one year from now. And, um, you know, the first thing I want to I want to say is that I read an article where 2019 is the year when the Gen Z population has become the largest consumer population in the world. So and I, I don't know the full like depiction, but for like every every baby boomer, there's like like three millennials, and for every millennial, every every millennial, there's like seven Gen Gen Zers, and so like. Just the, the sheer scale of the number of consumers and digital natives that are coming up through digital, through through um, um, that are maturing into the market right now. I think that's going to have a really big impact over the next year on the adoption of the consumer-facing standpoint of technology of the technology, particularly within decentralized applications. I think we'll see a lot more wider adoption in the next year of those particular applications. You know, like the Decentraland, for example, or the Brave browser. These are like these are like clever ways to help people like resist censorship or advertisements or um, or 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 have like unique digital assets. You know, like buying a physical a baseball card is cool, but having a digital asset on your phone that you can trade with your friends and your text messages that's a whole different story. That's that's more in line with I I feel like the the motivations of the Gen Z population. So I think we will see. 
uh, in short, to wrap this up, I think we'll see um, a lot more wide scale adoption of decentralized applications that are appealing to the Gen Z population. Uh, well, from my perspective, um, I'm actually going to be quite provocative here. Um, and, you know, we've spent the last um, very enjoyable uh, 40, 45 minutes talking about two worlds. You know, you have the crypto world, public world over here. You have the business, blockchain for business over here. My prediction is within a year, these will have come together technically. So that technically, I'm not talking about necessary implementations, but technically we will be in a hybrid where you stop worrying about whether a transaction is public or private, about whether a smart contract is public or private. It's either or both. And the analogy I would give is, uh, if you think about the World Wide Web, um, you know, I'm so old, I can remember when IBM put in token ring and then ripped it out and put in intranet uh, for lands and wands, right? And then you then hook up the front end of a website and then you put internet plus intranet, right? I think it's exactly the same with the blockchain. And it would be, right? Because we're going from the information superhighway to the transaction superhighway. So it's going to follow the same path. So the blockchain for business is the intranet uh, and the front end, the World Wide Web, is the public blockchain. And these two will, will, will come to get the actually archive. So you can pull it with your tokens uh, in it and you'll be able to spend those in a private channel or a public channel. And, and the user, certainly when it gets as far as the consumer, will not know. So when you go onto a website, you don't know when you flip over the firewall, right? It's seamless. If you're behind the firewall, you don't know when you flip out onto the internet. It's seamless, you don't see it. You just assume, right? And then you see, see, see a little padlock up there or whatever. It'll be the same. So within one year, I think, and there are already protocols here. You know, you've got Cosmos, you've got Polkadot, you've got a whole load of innovation, and there's a whole load of stuff um, that um, is happening around Hyperledger as well. Uh, as people start playing with Byzantine fault tolerance for ordering services, so you can have multiple ordering services. Um, so I, I think these two worlds, technically, I think will be cracked within a year. You're absolutely right. Within technology, we really value having having tech that just works, right? Having technology that's seamless and being able to merge these two worlds, get the best of both worlds. I believe he is going to open up a whole new world of possibility. As a matter of fact, that brings me to our next question. What exactly do we think blockchain is going to look like five years from now? And then we'll quickly go to 10 years from now and move over to the live Q&A with the audience. So five years. All right, I'll take the, I'll take the first out of five years as well. Um, you know, when I thought about this question, uh, um, I kind of thought about like myself <clears throat> in terms of like my history with blockchain. You know, I really got into to Bitcoin, like the 2017 hype wave. So to speak, I think in five years from now, I think there's a lot of people who got into Bitcoin in that last hype, hype wave. And I think there are a good percentage of them that are still in it. I think there's a small percentage of them who are super passionate about it. And I think one of those people will be the next, the head of, of a company that is the next Google in the next five years. And it's not going to be Coinbase. Uh, then for my prediction, so you know, a blockchain is a type of platform, platform business. I mean, any platform like Facebook, for example, any platform lives or dies by network effects. You go, the only reason you go on to, onto Facebook is because all your friends are on Facebook, so you can make lots of connections, right? There's no point being the only person on, on, a, on a private blockchain because you can't trade with anybody. You wanna, be, you wanna have lots of connections. So the really important thing which has to happen over the next five years is we have to build out network effects. And network effects is not linear. It's exponential. It's called um, Metcalfe's law. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's like um, N squared plus one, I think. You know, you add one and then, yeah. So there'll be an inflection point where there's enough traffic on the network that it suddenly becomes the place to go to find out what's going on. Now, if you look at trade levels, you know, we've recruited enough of most competitors now to in theory have 65% of the world shipping on. Now, you can't get those transactions until you've got all the ports, you've got all the um, shippers, you've got all the consignees, you've got all the other trading partners, right? 
Um, so it'll take a while, but the potential there is that that suddenly becomes the place to go for world trade. And that's just the first example out through the gate. So I think within one year, I'd like to see some technical breakthroughs around hybrid. And within five years, I'd like to see some real network effects and synergies kick in. Now with synergies, this is to do with innovation where if I'm building an app, if I'm building an app on a blockchain network, suddenly I don't have to worry about identity. It's done. That's a whole bunch of work I would have done, which I don't have to do for my app, right? If I suddenly don't have to worry about that provenance, you know, so you, so you, so you, so you pick up your phone, right? And I can tell you without any doubt, there's no child labor, no slave labor gone into mining the cobalt to go in that battery. And I just know it, right? It's just there because the provenance of that bag of cobalt, we've been talking about bags of cobalt, right? It's there, right? Now, the next generation of folks can come in and they can use this data to do interesting stuff. And that could be an AI app, by the way, right? It could be an AI app because you've got a new quality of data now to mine and to, and, and, and to build patterns upon. So the AI is most likely to stop by looking at the historic transactions, but you could also use it real time, making decisions, and you could embed it within the incentive model. So if you think about the governance, you can design a reward system to reward helpful behavior, you could have AI driving that reward behavior based on historic patterns. That's, that, that is really, really fun stuff to, to hear about. And, and specifically the AI example that you pulled is, is really exceptional. Two things I think you mentioned really make this impactful. First of all, the example of being able to make sure that you can like look at the battery within your phone and ensure using blockchain that there was no you know child or slave labor that went into um, creating the or, or mining the cobalt for that battery. That in itself is something that I'm sure people would absolutely you know love to have. Um, but then even apart from that, being able to leverage blockchain to gather data, to train AI systems, and then use AI to validate things on the blockchain in real time, that is where the next level of value comes in. And now as we move to the 10-year mark, who knows, maybe your, uh, maybe your shirt, Andy, might be answering our question for us. Maybe you don't need to say anything. Maybe your shirt uh, already answers it for us. <laughs> uh, well, I think you're right. I, I think that's my answer for 10 years. Um, so, so look, I've been doing business cases for technology most of my career. And when I started out, I did do a few 10-year business cases. I can tell you no executive would look much beyond five years. And most business cases are in the one to three year time horizon. So from a business case point of view, when you get 10 years out, it's Star Trek. Yeah, um, I do. And, and I want to qualify my last answer that I gave. I said, not Coinbase. I mean, I don't think it's going to be an exchange. I don't care what exchange it is, whether it's Binance or Kraken or Coinbase, it doesn't matter. I just don't think it's going to, I don't think an exchange provides enough value to be the next Google. Okay. So 10 years from now, um, I think we're going to see wide scale use in governments with use of distributed ledger technology in the form of what we're seeing in South Korea and Seoul. I think that is a brilliant model of where a government is providing more efficiency and more digital services to their to their citizens that I think we are all demanding. And it's just really cool to see where they're gonna give me something to do my public services. That's, that's such a different model than before where I, I do something and you give me in return as opposed to just always giving, giving, giving. So I think, I think we will see most governments leveraging blockchain to interact with their citizens on a much better level and i also think we will see the fundamental integration of cryptocurrencies into those ecosystems and 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 to provide i think the tokenized you know mechanism of interacting with with your citizens and giving them something that they can use is, is i think that's awesome i think there i think we will see wide-scale use of that on the government level once they figure out how to you know, I, I feel like governments have, have evolved and the role of governments has evolved so much in the past couple of decades. And, and, and that's because we see so much new technology out there that we got to start leveraging. And um, I believe, I, I'm forgetting exactly where it was, but there was a keynote in Dubai, I believe it was um, something along the lines of the International 
um, government communication forum, something of that sort. Um, and one of the key points that I was mentioning there um, was that nowadays it's 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 difficult for governments to be able to understand or even communicate properly with all of its citizens because it doesn't scale that way, right? It's, it's easy for the government to get a, a message across to its citizens, but it's more difficult for citizens to really get their voice heard by a government, which is where, you know, AI technology comes in and the machine learning can help us understand unstructured data at scale, sure, but I feel like blockchain is also a technology that we're going to start to expect to be something that governments start to use more often or, or, or generally sort of go more mainstream in the next couple of years because we're going to need it to scale up, you know, governments and enable them to take the roles on that citizens want them to. So you're absolutely right. I think we're going to start to see more adoption, not just in business, not just in consumers, but public governments as well. And, and I can't wait to see that happen. It's going to be really fun to see how we're able to get that done. Now, all of this technology is fun. We've talked about some really complex algorithms. We've talked about quantum computing. We've talked about all sorts of different stuff. And technology, actually, even before we get into the live Q&A, there's something I wanted to ask you, Andy. You know, we usually don't associate technology with creativity, uh, unfortunately, even though I think technology is one of the most creative fields, you know, out there. But something we do usually uh, associate with creativity is art. And I see a piece of art behind you, which was painted by your 15-year-old daughter, Katie. Would you like to tell me a bit more about that? Uh, well, yeah, so this is a, a, a copy famous painting by, uh, by Larry. Um which is quite close to where, to where, 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 where I live in Manchester. Uh, it's a industrial age. Um, and um, I, I, I thought I was um, cr 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 creating a copy of this picture in centimeters, and it turns out to be inches. So it's like four times bigger than I thought, <laughs> but, but it seems to have blown up okay. Very nice. It, it looks great. So thank you for sharing that with all of us. And so now I would love to get into some questions from the audience. There have been quite a few different questions. And I want to start off with a question um, from, from Michael Francis. So he's asking us, what are some unexpected use cases of, of blockchain technology? Something that we don't usually talk about today, but something that will be enabled in the future thanks to technological breakthroughs or, or, or really something that doesn't exist today, but we do expect it to happen in the future, something that's unintuitive, something that you wouldn't expect to happen. Uh, okay, well, so I, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, I can think of a couple of use cases that um, I think are going to be interesting. So let's start with 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 cars and autonomous cars. Um, I think there's, there's there's this notion of, what, of what's called like a car e what. So the idea would be that um, your car comes preloaded with a wallet full of tokens, uh, and these tokens in the wallet in your car can interact with the world around you. So the car can pay for your parking. Um, the car can pay for your um, your tolls as you go through a motorway. The car could even pay for a cup of coffee as you as you as you stop um, at, at the service station. Um, and you could extend this further into the whole notion of the sharing economy, where you start thinking, well, why would I own a car, right? Why should it be sitting on my front drive nine times out of ten doing nothing, right? So you move into this whole notion of shared ownership where the car could become a business. If it's my car, it becomes a business. So I um, have an algorithm which says, well, okay, I'm willing to trade with five star folks or, or people in my family and friends and family, or maybe I'm willing to, to push out and, and go for folks I don't know. So it, it becomes a business for me. So I think this whole notion of car and car repayments is super interesting and micro transactions, the ability you know, small little transactions. And this also comes across into smarter cities. So one of the great things about blockchain is where you can pull together data from a cross industry perspective. So different industries that wouldn't normally collaborate can come together. So you could have a city where maybe the Coordination and the collaboration brings together the city. It brings together, for example, Wi-Fi providers. You know, so all the telcos will have like 2G networks. Now, if you want to have a, a smarter city application, uh, so you've got smarter parking, for example, we, we just had that one with the Cori Wallet. Um, it's going to be super expensive to do that over 5G or even 4G. 
but there's enough 2G networks that you could do it over 2G. The problem is these are all owned by different telcos, right? So what you do is you put in an abstraction there, so your coin becomes an abstraction there. So you, when you onboard to, to the app and, and you download that wallet, you effectively join all the networks. And then, and then the blockchain is basically doing all the intercompany accounting as you have so many microseconds on that network, so many microseconds on that network, so, so many microseconds on the other network. Um, and it's actually going to do that for you. So you're abstracted away from that. And then you settle in fiat once, uh, once a quarter, once a year, or whatever, and the, the delta. So I think microtransactions, autonomous cars, new business models around the sharing economy, um, I think are inevitable. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think that was a great answer. And then I'll follow up with just something a little, a little bit different in terms of a way to think about it. I think also something maybe you might not consider is the current blockchain technology solutions, I mean, purely from a consumer standpoint, I think the same, same thing can be said for business blockchain solutions. But I think there is a, there's going to be something happen where people start to look at those solutions and it was built for a specific market. And people are going to be like, hey, that could be applied to this other market over here. And I think the, the unintended applications of, of things that are already built on, on markets that you're not thinking about right now. And for example, like I've mentioned, I think on two different times, this, this application called Decentraland. And you can go to it. It's essentially a, it's a world where you can buy and sell digital parcels of land on a blockchain. Like it's pretty, it's pretty abstract, but, and, and essentially it's developed where you're essentially part of this community creating this simulated world. You know, it's very much like the Sims, but you're actually paying money and bartering for these pieces of land. And that's how it expands the ecosystem. And you're like, all right, that sounds like something somebody would do on their pastime when they're bored. But consider somebody who is disabled or quadriplegic. Consider them having the ability to put on virtual reality glasses and experience this world where they're actually transacting with money and actually doing like goods and services on like in a world where they're not able to do that. I think the unintended application of some of these things that are already built on markets you're not thinking about is something that is um, something that you'll see that you're not that you might not be considering right now. Thank you very much for sharing, and it's interesting to see what the what the future of blockchain looks like in terms of unexpected use cases. Right, these are the things that can really give us insight into what the field is evolving to. And so there's, oh, so, so, so there's one more um, an, an, an unexpected use case actually that I'd like to talk about which is, if you think about all of this COVID stuff, right, um, it's really important for you to have some kind of token um, on your phone, which is going to give trust around your test results and your antibody results. So you can, um, for example, get access to a football match, get access to, uh, to, to, to a plane. Um, you know, what kind of Whirls the wheels in the, in the back of my mind is this is this is this an entry point into building out a large identity solution as an unexpected entry point into fixing that first use case for identity and could COVID CB19 and the things we have to do tactically to fix that could that be an entry point into establishing identity um, on the blockchain as an unexpected outcome. Well, all I know is I can't wait to see the future of blockchain technology, right? This is, this is going to be really fun stuff to see how it integrates, especially with what you mentioned around COVID. How can we make sure that, you know, for example, somebody has the antibodies to COVID or isn't infected with COVID, right? This, this is what the future looks like by enabling us to still live and work normally, you know, but, but at the same time, be safe, be secure, which unfortunately right now means we ought to, you know, socially distance and, and stay home and these sorts of things. So hopefully in the future, we can, we can, we can enable more normalcy with the power of blockchain tech. As a matter of fact, the, uh, before there's another question related to this, but first I want to take a step back and answer another question because I feel like this one's really interesting. Um, from Pratik, Pratik Patil. He's asking, what skills are big tech giants like IBM looking for in the field of blockchain from young candidates like me? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> skills I'm looking for. Um... I mean, certainly, um, we're looking for 
people to marry business and technology. And, and, and this, this is not unique to, to blockchain. I think this is a classic consulting where you're looking to have somebody that, that can operate on both the business side of things and the technology side of things. But what's particularly important, I think, in a blockchain perspective is because this is a governance technology, you have to be very comfortable to be having those governance type conversations. So it's almost like a hybrid of three skill sets. You need business skills so you can understand the market and the market dynamics. You need technology skills so at least you can understand at a high level what are the capabilities and what is the trend of technologies. And then you need the ability to facilitate a conversation around governance, which is about banging heads together of executives to agree on a set of marketplace rules. So kind of a hybrid of three skills, I would say, uh, is what kind of my little bit of IBM would be looking for. Um, obviously, that's any a part. It's not, it's not a whole piece. And Tim, uh, do you have anything to share in terms of what Bottle Rocket might be looking for from blockchain tech? Well, Bottle Rocket's not real heavy into blockchain right now. And I, I think that's mainly as a result of the fact that you don't see a lot of uh, blockchain integrated into like pure B, large brand, pure B2C mobile or web applications as it stands. But uh, Bottle Rocket did just recently help build and rebuild and launch MoneyGrams. Uh, consumer facing mobile application and web application. And if you've been paying attention, they have done some interesting things with in relation with the Ripple network. Now, Bottle Rocket did not do any of the back end work on that. It was just purely front end work and orchestrating those those back end APIs. And and we particularly don't hire for blockchain as it stands, but I think as more brands see the value in blockchain and understand how that it's a governance technology that can help you be more efficient in any business. I think you're going to see a lot larger demand for two different roles. One, the same as Andy said, somebody who can understand the intersection of business and technology and fundamentally understand what blockchain is and how it translates into value for a business so that you can create solutions on top of it. And then two, you need more developers, there's a severe shortage of pure developers who are focused on the either the language or the architecture of blockchain. So specifically Ethereum, for example. Ethereum is, you know, is a little bit different than the traditional networks in the, fa in the sense that it is a smart contract based network. And there is a specific language that you use to develop on that network called Solidity. And so you, we need more people that understand this language and all you know, the other types of languages that are underpinning some of the other smart contract based networks. And so developers who are centered on that as, as, as a skill, I see that becoming a larger demand. And I know there's a severe shortage. And I think if you have those skills as a stand, you can find a position somewhere in, in the world for employment outside of, of Bottle Rocket. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot bigger demand from a consumer facing standpoint as time goes along in the next five years. I wouldn't be surprised if Bottle Rocket did hire somebody who fit those who fit those descriptions within the next zero to five years. Consumer facing adoption of blockchain is going to increase. You're absolutely right. And I can't wait because I'm sure in the future, uh, companies like Bottle Rocket are going to require experts within that within that field. Uh, now, I would also like to sort of go a little bit back to our to our previous question. There is another question from the live stream related to that, and that is, can blockchain help us with voting, right? Can it help us increase voter turnout? Can it help us, you know, decrease election fraud, these sorts of things? What are your thoughts? Uh, well, my thoughts are uh, I'm really, really upset because my colleague Anthony Day um, posts a, a podcast every Saturday. Uh, and Saturday, uh, today's podcast was voting. Um, and I didn't listen to it because I was preparing my answers to your questions, Tamne. <laughs> so I would have listened to that and I would have had all the gem on voting. So what I will say is please Google uh, my colleague, Anthony Day. Uh, have a look at his, his, his podcast, uh, which is called Blockchain Won't Save the World. Um, and I do actually... Um, always argue with Anthony because I think blockchain will save the world, but he says, no, blockchain won't save the world. We will, uh, I think. Anyway, um, he, he, look at today's uh, podcast and there's a whole podcast answering exactly that question. So that's the place to go. So I've given you a link rather than an answer. 
have, I'll put I have, I'll put the link in the description, but also Tim go. I have I have two questions. I have two responses to that. Um, I think first, yes, I think it absolutely can help. You know, I've always I've always wondered why we don't have a mobile app that allows us to vote. I think it's ridiculous that we don't. I think blockchain technology could allow the U.S. government or any, whoever's running the election cycles to be able to give us a secure way that we would all trust in voting in a, in a truly digital, decentralized fashion. Um, secondly, I've always, I've always thought it would be cool if the U.S. government were to distribute more surveys or have more polls available where you could go vote on certain either topic, not vote, but put your opinion down on certain important topics of the day to tell people how you think. And that could be taken into account in terms of, you know, the state of the nation. But, you know, I, th I feel like in the current state, if you just built that, most people wouldn't trust it, right? And I think you could use blockchain in, in, in a voting type application to get more people to provide feedback on their opinion on things that could give a better per, better perspective to who's making decisions in government. That definitely makes sense. So, Sorry, go ahead. So, this, so that's my answer. Yeah, totally. And you're right. I feel like with blockchain technology, going back to what we were mentioning in the beginning of, of today's episode, it's all about trust, right? And with blockchain technology, we have a way to offload trust from people that we can't, well, entities that we can't trust, humans, to things that we can trust, machines running mathematical uh, mathematical uh, problems. And so, in a way, that's, that's an interesting way to think about it. But next, I do want to sort of pivot a little bit. You've talked about trust. Now let's talk about AI. Andy, uh, you were already sort of, uh, you know, alluding towards the impact that blockchain can have on AI and AI on blockchain. Would you like to expand a little bit more on what it is that blockchain enables us to do in terms of gathering data that we couldn't have done without it that is specifically relevant to AI. Maybe doing things like helping us solve the bias problem or helping us make sure that everybody's equally represented within data sets, these sorts of things. What do you think that impact of blockchain will be on, on, on training? And, and of course, you or Tim, you know. Uh, well, so I'll, I'll try to answer that one, but I'm a little bit on shaky ground here now. Um, but, but I think what blockchain does is it brings a new class of data. So now if you're training your AI on the historical ledger, and if this were, if this were a, a blockchain for business, then we can tell you exactly where that data came from and who owns that data. So it's not anonymous data, massive great big data lakes where um, you're looking very much at the aggregate level. Um, it's very precise, um, and you can train your data, uh, train your AI on, 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 a, on a much better quality of data and provenance of data. Um, so I think I think that's one thing that that I think you would need a blockchain to do. Now this is this is not a pattern that I've yet seen in production. I have done one project, or I'm doing one project with AI and blockchain, but that one is slightly different in that it's more a matter of saying, well, there are some quite large documents which are being stored on this blockchain. Um, and these documents are big PDFs with loads of natural language in there. So you're using the AI effectively to trawl through those big documents, right? So that's not really a blockchain. It's, well, it's kind of a blockchain case, I guess, in that you're kind of proving the provenance of that document. So this is an emerging field, and I, I wouldn't have a, a, a firm answer for this. I'm on shaky ground. No worries. And Tim, would you like to go ahead on that too? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little on shaky ground on that one too. But what, I, what I'll say about that is I think first is that, you know, sometimes, sometimes it takes, you know, capturing and presenting data in a particular particular way in order to get people to take action. And I think blockchain could enable us to collect data in certain places that would allow us to present the current state of things in a way to get people to understand a lot better and be able to have the motivation to take action. So consider countries that have corruption or, or in just very tough situations. Do we have the ability to create systems 
that can allow us to collect data from people in those environments where they trust they can give an honest answer without, you know, being without the consequences of, you know, being, you know, put in prison or something like that. Can we get data from places in, in a way where people trust us enough to, to give us the honest answer uh, through the use of some of these some of these new technologies? So I think, you know, it might not be the particular technical answer, but I think from a theoretical standpoint, a use case standpoint, I think, you know, blockchain can be used for for these certain areas. And, and I personally have always thought blockchain at, will have the most impact on these countries, which is like the unbanked, the people, the countries where there's large groups of minorities in the U.S. who are sending money very long distances back to their to people to their families, and they might pay five dollars every time they send back one hundred dollars to their family. You know what I mean? So, like, I think blockchain can fundamentally help those countries and help people understand why we should be helping them. But, but I think I think one thing which might end up being important is that if this data that the AI is using to, to train itself is on a blockchain, then we know the provenance of that data, we know the ownership of that data. Um, so therefore, any benefits that come out of that AI can reward the original owner of that data. Any permission to use that data by the AI engine can be granted by the owner. I think the danger is, you know, if you look at identity, the danger is I sign on with everything, with my Facebook or my Google account, and I've given away wonderful data to be monetized for which I get no benefit. So I've basically become the product uh, and I've made the data aggregator very rich. Wouldn't it be great if that data, if I'd signed on with my own credentials, uh, if I own that, I could choose whether to release that data to somebody who wants to drive AI on it. And maybe I could do a commercial deal. And I could say, well, yes, you can use my data, but you've got to give me something back, right? Um, you've got to give me a service, maybe. You've got to give me some money. You've got to give me something, right? So what it does is it divvies up the pie. Because I think the danger is if we carry on with the path that we are, is we end up in a world dominated by a few companies controlling vast data lakes of our data upon which we have no control. Uh, and these companies become ever more powerful and ever more valuable. You know, you've only got to go to the U.S., stock market and look at the, you know, look at the big companies at the top uh, and you know a fair chunk of that is going to be monetizing our data thank you very much you know so unless you want the future of being a digital slave then maybe a blockchain might be a good idea absolutely, absolutely. and and really the, there there are a couple things and and first of all what you mentioned around the trade-off right and, and sorry not what you mentioned about the trade-off but about being rewarded for the data that you're providing right Right now, there's always a trade-off when you do something. Like if you if you go on your phone and you want to use Siri, for example, or if you want to use Google Assistant, and if you if you believe that that service that they're providing you is valuable enough for them to be able to capture and monetize your data, then so be it. Right? That, that's that's your decision. You think that Siri is so valuable in your life that it deserves your data. Some people wouldn't, right? Like uh, iOS 14 now provides you the option to allow or disallow tracking for everything, and about 75 to 80% of iPhone users completely don't allow tracking. Only a small minority actually think it's worth, you know, that, that service. Um, so being able to be actually like financially compensated or rewarded for providing a company with that data really tips that, that sort of trade-off scale and makes it so that people actually want to share their data. And at the same time, it also helps us solve problems like, for example, the recent controversy around the Pulse algorithm. Right now it was only generating faces of a certain race, but that wasn't a machine learning problem, that was a data problem. Right? Fundamentally, you cannot call that an algorithm problem because if you do that, then we've devolved back to like, you know, feature, um, feature engineering and stuff. The entire point of modern machine learning and deep learning is that we don't, you know, mess around with the internals of how the algorithm figures out what it needs to figure out, and we just allow it to work. We just provide it with data. And with blockchain enabling everybody to have a voice, enabling everybody to sort of prove ownership of data, prove permission to use data, I do believe that we will have that, that opportunity uh, to have more fair AI algorithms. So AI and blockchain really do fit in so many different ways because both are so applicable in so many different industries. So I, I cannot wait to see um, where, where we apply that technology. Now one more thing I do want to say uh, before we go, actually one thing I want to ask the two of you. 
What is, uh, just, I mean, you know that our audience is, is really diverse, right? We've got developers, we've got people from business, we've got people that are, you know, pretty deep in the field of technology and blockchain. We've got some people who may have never used this sort of technology. So we've got a really diverse audience. And based off of what we've discussed today, is there a, would you like to share a closing message with the audience? Uh, well, Sidney, Sidney, my, my takeaway would be, you know, think of blockchain as a governance tech as a governance and not a financial technology. Uh, think of it as about power. Um, and I think that blockchain is something that needs to be taken rather than given. Because the people who control marketplaces today are unlikely to give up control of that. It's up to us to take what's rightfully ours. And I think blockchain is a mechanism to rebalance democracy. It needs to be taken, not given. Um, so folks, it's a decision that we all need to make. Don't sit back and wait for it to arrive in your inbox. You've got to go out and help make it happen. You have a responsibility to democratize data for generations to come. Thank you very much. And Tim? Yeah, so I guess my, my closing remark here would be, um, and thanks again, Tim, for having us on. This, this was great. Um, um, and Andy, it was, it was also great to collaborate with you on this. This, is, this has been awesome. So my, my, my final remark here would be, you know, um, I think, I think the, the quote that Andy says is think about it as a governance technology is incredible. So for me, have a fundamental understanding of what blockchain actually is. So you understand what's going on in this space. And then for me, from a consumer facing standpoint, how I look at blockchain, I'm always looking for decisions in the market that I don't agree with, either a business or a government or whatever it is. I'm like, I just fundamentally don't agree with that decision and i try and think is there an opportunity for blockchain to play a role in there to help alleviate that decision case in point here one thing that i think is ridiculous is the fact that in america for banks if you were to give if you were to cash a check on like friday at a certain point in time that check would not clear through the automated clearing house which handled the transactions between banks in america until the, until monday so Two business days, it wouldn't process. And the reason for that is because the servers that run the automated clearinghouse simply shut down on the weekends. And I, I, somebody told me, yeah, but that's because, you know, the federal government shuts down and there's interest rates. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about interest rates. I want my money to go from point A to point B. And this is trivial at this point. So I think looking at, looking at fundamental problems you don't agree with and thinking if there are better ways where we could all work together to make those decisions is a really good way to think about what's a good blockchain solution to develop. Thank you very much, Andy and Tim, for sharing your thoughts. This has been incredibly insightful. Uh, specifically, you know, Andy, what you mentioned around, we have this opportunity today, if we develop and, and leverage this technology the right way, to democratize access to data and, and the uh, ability to provide data. For, for generations to come. And, and you're absolutely right. We need to start looking at the future, how we want this technology to be shaped up into the future. We need to start seeing what it's all about. And Timothy, you're absolutely right in the sense that you mentioned, you know, having that fundamental understanding of this technology is really important, right? If this is something that you're interested in, if it's something that, you know, that, that, that you think provides value, having that understanding and being able to say, where do I not agree with something? How can we use blockchain or, or really any technology at that point to help solve that issue that is really valuable thank you very much for sharing today's conversation was just it, it was so exciting right i've learned so much i'm sure the audience has learned so much i love this quote that blockchain's a governance technology that 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 sort of changes the way you think about blockchain technology altogether from a fundamental standpoint and you know how we mentioned you know in a year from now we'll start to see business blockchain and cryptocurrencies and consumer facing blockchain come together into this one unified platform that's more seamless and how in five ten years we'll start to see more governments and uh, and and sort of public sector sort of um, starting to adapt this technology a lot more. This is a future that I'm, again, incredibly excited for, and I cannot wait for it. So once again, thank you very much to Andy and Tim for joining me today. I really appreciate your thoughts. I really appreciate your insights. I'm sure that just like I have, the audience has found this talk invaluable. Uh, now, one more thing that I do want to mention is that, of course, thank you, everybody, for joining the stream today. Uh, now, this stream is held every Sunday in the morning Eastern time, uh, and next, we've got, next week we've got some really exciting content lined up for you. We're getting 
a sales executive on the show with over 20 years of experience. Uh, and she's going to be talking about how to sell technology the right way and how to increase diversity in technology education. Because, again, it's going to be some really exciting stuff. But once again, thank you for joining in today. If there are any questions that we weren't able to answer from the live stream, feel free to put those in the comments and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So thank you very much everyone for joining. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Tim. And goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Tim May. Bye now. Bye-bye.